Hi everyone, Science Daddy here, uh, and I wanted to respond to one of the questions. Uh, Leather Blue Fire wanted me to talk about the James Webb Space Telescope, which has just uh, finished all of its deployments and is now in the process of cooling down and getting commissioned to do its science. Um, it's going to be a number of months before the telescope is ready to actually have first light um, and do its first scientific observations. Um, but uh, it's going to have a long life and uh, a lot of really great science is going to come out of it. Um, <coughs> but uh, Leather Blue Fire wanted to know more about the sun shield. Um, in particular, he asked if it was something that was used to absorb or reflect solar radiation, and also asked about the probability that this shield might be hit by debris, micrometeorites and dust that exists in the solar system and uh, what, uh, what that means for the lifetime of James Webb. Well, um, first let's talk about why it has the sun shield. Um, so James Webb is an infrared telescope, uh, primarily. So it's looking um, at infrared objects that emit light in the infrared wavelengths. Uh, and that's anything that's um, longer than visible light. Um, so things that are um, uh, cooler than um, uh, what you would normally uh, you know, encounter in, uh, uh, as light emitting objects. Like if you look at like a heating element on a stove, it gets red hot and then you know, glows orange, or even a flame or, or an incandescent bulb, you know, those things have been heated up to uh, temperatures in the hundreds of degrees, up to thousands of degrees, and they glow uh, in the visible range and we can see them. But things that are cooler than that, like me and, and you know, plants and, and anything on this earth, um, it has some temperature and that temperature does emit light. It does emit photons, um, but they're in the infrared um, and they're hard to see. And uh, in astronomy, there's amazing things uh, in, out in the universe, uh, both nearby and in great distances, looking far back into the history of the universe. Um, you know, things have been redshifted through the expansion of the universe, and there's just a lot of interesting things that are going on where we can look so far back, but we have to be able to see those infrared wavelengths. Um, Earth's atmosphere is really good at fuzzing that sort of stuff out and interfering with it, so getting into space to do it is, uh, is uh, you know, kind of de rigueur if you're going to do like, the next level of scientific investigation. Uh, and that's what James Webb is designed to do. It's got instruments that um, are infrared, both near infrared, so just a little bit longer than, than red that we can see, and uh, stuff that's mid-infrared, which is an even colder uh, wavelength range. Well, in order to see those things, the telescope itself has to be cold. Um, because if it's hot, it emits its own infrared photons, and those will just block out or fuzz out the, the things that you're actually interested in. Um, so it's in space and space can, you know, the dark, the blackness of space, you know, the, the far distance is very cold, but it's up the sun and the warm earth and the moon and other things nearby that, that could, uh, you know, heat it up. So the sun shield is designed to reflect that, uh, that radiation away from the telescope so that the primary mirror can be on the order of 50 Kelvin, uh, so, so very cold, um, and then the, uh, the main uh, near-infrared instruments operated around 39 degrees Kelvin, and they're additionally cooled by some passive radiators. Uh, and then there's the mid-wavelength uh, instrument, which is um, uh, actively cooled with a cryo-cooler system uh, that brings it down to 7 Kelvin. Um, so um, all this is to make sure the telescope is cold and can see the things that it's interested in. And the sun shield does the lion's share of that work. Um, so what, what, what is it? Uh, so you've got these, um, I mean, the sun is bombarding it, and there's about like 250,000 watts of energy hitting the area of the sun shield and the spacecraft bus down here and everything else. And it's great for the solar panels, but you need to keep that heat away from the telescope and the instruments. Um, and with the sun shield, there's five layers of this stuff, and um, you know, 250,000 watts in the first one, less than a watt comes out of the furthest sun shield, the, the, cool, the coolest one. Um, and so, uh, so how does this work? Well, the sun shields, they're incredibly thin, 
um, and they're made of a material called Kapton. Kapton is kind of like the duct tape of space. We use it on everything. Um, oftentimes the Kapton material will have a polyamide uh, uh, coating applied to it that makes it sticky, and that's the duct tape, that's the sticky material that's used on a lot of spacecraft. Um, uh, but it's also used to make structures. Uh, and the nice thing about Kapton is it's, um, it, it's, it's Kapton E. It was developed by DuPont in the 1960s. And um, it's very stable over a wide range of temperatures. It doesn't burn and it doesn't, it doesn't char um, uh, when, you, when you get really hot and it's stable at cold temperatures. It's also really stable in vacuum. And that's important because, um, you know, like regular plastics that you're used to seeing around you, if you put them in a vacuum, they will start letting out organic compounds and they'll start decomposing in the vacuum, which is bad for the material because it weakens the thing. Um, and also those bits that get thrown off, those molecules, they can go get stuck on mirrors and sensitive optics and or mess up sensors and anything like that. So you don't want that. You want something that's really stable in a, uh, in a vacuum environment. So Kapton is that. Um, and um, it's, um, checking my notes here, make sure I hit all the points that I want to hit. Um, so let's talk about the sun shield, which is made of cacton. Nothing about this happens by accident. Um, uh, the size, the number of layers, their shape, all of that is specifically designed to achieve the goal of cooling the telescope and longevity. James Webb had you know, sort of a primary lifetime of 10 years, and we recently learned that because of the great push that the Ariane 5 rocket gave to it during its launch, it's going to probably have about enough fuel to keep itself in position for about 20 years, which is great. Um, but that means all of these things have to, you know, live that long, survive, and, and continue to function. Um, so the sun shields, which reflect the, the radiation, they are, um, so you've got these five layers, uh, the, the bottom two layers have a coating, it's a, it's a, a silicon alloy. Um, it's really good at reflecting the sun's light, um, and it, uh, but silicon itself is a semiconductor and, and, and doesn't do a great job uh, moving electricity around, so it's doped with some other uh, elements to make it electrically conductive. So the whole thing, this whole thing which has, is met has metallic coatings on it is grounded and doesn't have any risk of uh, electrostatic discharge. The, the, the back layers uh, have an aluminum coating, which is also conductive, uh, and is really good at getting rid of heat and emitting it out into space. Um, and a lot of that emission actually happens between the layers. So each layer is separated by gaps, and those gaps are just filled with the vacuum of space, which is a really great insulator. Um, and uh, uh, any heat, any photons of infrared heat that make it through one layer or, or emitted by one layer, they get absorbed and, 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 uh, by, the, by the next layer, but some of them actually bounce around on those reflective uh, uh, aluminum coatings and end up going out the sides. Um, and you have this for multiple layers. Um, the fifth layer is kind of, um, it's margin. Uh, I, think, I think it could probably get by, do its job with only four, but like I said, 250,000 watts to one watt. That's a great uh, range of, of uh, uh, you know, a reduction. They're shaped in a particular way, so the telescope never sees the edges of the, the hotter uh, front layers. Uh, the layers in the back are, are a little bit more curved, and from the point of view of all of this structure up here, it only ever sees that top layer. Um, oh, and the, the things are, oh, I've lost, my, I've lost my visuals. Darn it. Um, anyway, the, um, uh, uh, the layers, uh, they're slightly angled also, so that again, those photons can work their way out. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, so that's what they do. That's what they're designed to do is to, to keep those, uh, to, to keep the telescope cool. What about impacts? What about interstellar or interplanetary dust? Um, so there is such stuff, something like four to 8,000 metric tons of, uh, space dust falls to earth, um, every day. Uh, no, every year, sorry, every year. Uh, 4,000 to 8,000 metric tons of dust falling onto Earth every year. Well, the Earth is big, and it's also a great big vacuum because of its gravity. Um, out at L2, uh, the place where James Webb is orbiting, so Sun is here, Earth is here, and L2 is out here, 
um, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a little bit further away from the gravity well of the Earth, but there's still a significant flux of material. I looked at a couple of papers and it seemed, if I was reading the charts right, that if you imagine something like the size of a grain of table salt, um, how often would something like that, probabilistically speaking, hit James Webb? Um, and what I found is like for a square meter of area, um, it would be more than a billion seconds between impacts of salt grain sized uh, dust. Uh, well, that's more like sand actually, a salt grain. Um, uh, uh, so a billion seconds, that's like 31 years. Um, you know, James Webb is much bigger than one square meter, uh, but uh, you're, it's going to get hit. It's going to get hit with this, this dusty material. And, uh, you know, some stuff is, you know, orbiting around the sun, just like James Webb and Earth is. Um, so the relative velocities might not be that great. But there's always a chance that there's stuff coming in opposite and, and could have a much higher velocity. So um, NASA's well aware of this. There have been a lot of studies about micrometeorites uh, and, and their potential impact on uh, Earth orbiting and interplanetary spacecraft. Um, and you can't avoid it. Uh, but um, they had done a lot of testing. I think there was a six-year testing program for the Sun Shield. And that included everything. It included checking its thermal stability. It included uh, looking at its uh, response to radiation. Because out there at L2, you don't have the Earth's magnetic field protecting you uh, most of the time. You're kind of in the tail of it. Uh, and uh, it, it doesn't do a great job protecting you from solar radiation. So that first layer of the Sun Shield is getting bombarded with everything that the Sun puts out. Um, photons as well as, you know, charged particles from the solar wind. Um, and also the whole thing, it had to be folded up and unfolded. Um, and, uh, but what they did, I couldn't find the actual like test report from this. It may or may not be public, but um, I know that they did a hypervelocity uh, testing program where they bombarded uh, your test pieces of this material with uh, sand-sized micrometeorite type grains at like 12 kilometers per second, which is around about the escape velocity for the Earth. So it's, it's, it's a good range. And, you know, I imagine that these things, the larger ones probably punched right through it. Um, turns out that the smaller ones, smaller dust grains, they're not, they're, they don't, not really tough. They're not like BBs. They're, they're, they're little, like silicate materials left over from the formation of the solar system, um, a lot of them. And uh, they will uh, disintegrate, even on impact with something as thin as the, the, the sun shield, which is, you know, they say around the thickness of a human hair. It's about 50 microns thick. And human hair is ranged from, like, 17 microns for like body hair to uh, this is probably like a hundred microns or so um, but uh, it, it's, it's like the thickness of a candy wrapper and you've got a tennis ball or tennis court size you know uh, area collecting area here so uh, it gets hit and some of the micrometeorites disintegrate some of them punch through um, but the the shield is designed with rip stops uh, it's hard to see in a lot of the renderings uh, I've looked at but there are actually places where individual layers they are bonded to each other it's not totally a vacuum gap there are places where they're bonded to one another and they have some reinforcing strips on them as well they're rip stops essentially because Kapton is really tough if you don't have a tear in it but once you get a tear that tear can propagate so you want to have something that will stop that propagation um, so uh, so they've tested it, and they know that it's probably going to suffer some damage, uh, but uh, uh, the expectation, and I have every reason to believe that there's been a lot of math and analysis that goes behind this expectation, is that it will easily survive the 10-year the lifetime, and, and very likely the 20 as well. Um, the primary mirror, you might want to ask about that too, because um, that's going to get hit. That's going to get hit with, with micrometeorite bits. And they're going to create little craters. They're going to create little bits that, 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 that damage the mirrors in a particular area. But that really only deflects and scatters the photons from that little spot. The rest of the mirror, which is huge, um, uh, you know, it, it will be unaffected by that one little grain hit. So um, you're going to, over the course of its lifetime, the mirrors are going to get peppered with all kinds of little uh, micrometeorite bits. But the majority of the collecting area is still going to be uh, good and uh, you know, uh, uh, producing good science. Um, I think that's all the things I wanted to say. Let me double check. Um, uh, and that just went off too. So I guess this is the end. Um, uh, uh, Leather Blue Fire, I hope I answered your question. Please ask more if you want. Um, I did not work on James Webb. I am not an expert on this, uh, but I did look up a couple of really cool links 
that talk about the Sun Shield and James Webb in general, and I've included those in the description. Um, yeah, I hope that's uh, useful and informative, and thanks for watching. Talk to you later.